In this week's Ancient History News, I discuss the discovery of an Ice Age bead in Wyoming that was created by the Clovis culture. This is one of the oldest beads found so far in the Americas. I then talk about the publication of new radiocarbon dates for several of the wooden plaques etched with the undeciphered Rongorongo script from Easter Island, and new research into how Neolithic farmers wiped out the hunter-gatherer population of Denmark. Archaeologists discover ancient tubular bone bead in Wyoming. During the Paleolithic, beads were first used for personal adornment in Africa and then Eurasia, with archaeologists seeing this as an indicator of increasing social complexity. As I mentioned in my video last week, a new paper suggests that jewellery worn on the European continent more than 24,000 years ago may have signified membership to a particular cultural group. However, there are very few examples from early Paleo-Indian sites in the Americas, at least none from secure contexts. Uncertain examples include a Kalish bead found at the Mockingbird Gap site in New Mexico, and four hematite beads found in a Clovis Age burial in Colorado. Bone beads dating to the later Younger Dryas have been recovered from the Linden Meyer, Powers II and Hell Gap sites. Now a research team have discovered a tubular bone bead from the La Prelle Mammoth site in Wyoming. Details of this discovery and the examination of the bead have been published in the journal Scientific Reports. Dating back around 12,940 years, this is one of the oldest beads found so far in the Americas. The La Prelle Mammoth site was first excavated in 1987. At that time, chipped stone artifacts were found alongside the remains of a sub-adult Colombian mammoth. Later on, archaeologists found hearths nearby and determined that the site had been a camp. The occupation of the area was dated to 12,941 years ago, plus or minus 56 years. Around 11 meters south-southeast of where the mammoth was found is an area labeled Block B, which had the remnants of a hearth, red ochre stain, more than 1,000 pieces of chipped stone, several fragments of eyed bone needles, and the butchered and burned remains of bison. The bead was found by a research team led by Professor Todd Suraveld from the University of Wyoming in Block B, one meter northwest of the hearth's center within the red ochre stain. Measuring seven millimeters in length and with an external diameter of 2.9 millimeters, the small tubular shaped bead has several groove marks on it. These may have been decoration, but could also have been side effects of the manufacturing process or from being worn. Similar grooves appear on other Paleolithic tubular bone beads. The bead was smoothed and polished and coated in red ochre. However, the red ochre might simply be because the bead was found in stained sediment. An examination of the bead showed that it most likely came from a part of the metatarsal bone of a hare. The team has determined that this bead is the first proper evidence for the use of hairs by Clovis foragers. The researchers considered the possibility that the bead had been produced by carnivore consumption and digestion rather than being a human creation. However, they deemed this unlikely for a few reasons. Only one such highly polished bone fragment was found at the site. The bone came from a part of the skeleton with a low nutritional value. The bead was found in a cultural layer. No carnivore modification of faunal remains has been found there, and the grooves on the bead's surface could be produced by either humans or carnivores. So if the bead was produced by Clovis foragers, it's the oldest evidence from the manufacture of personal adornments in the Americas, except for modified giant sloth bones dating to the last glacial maximum that were found in Brazil. Thus far, evidence for bead manufacture from hair bones has been found from later Holocene sites in Wyoming, the Great Basin and the Southwest. Since similar beads have been found at Paleolithic sites in Northeast Asia, including the Denisova cave, there is of course the possibility that such a practice arrived in the Americas via the Bering Land Bridge. However, this would be pure speculation at this point. New radiocarbon dates published on the Rongorongo script. 
Rapa Nui, also known as Easter Island, is located 3,800 kilometers off the coast of Chile. It was settled between 1150 and 1280 before Europeans arrived in the 1700s. Famous for its giant statues called Moai, the island went through considerable environmental degradation and, by the end of the 19th century, much of its traditional culture had been lost as well. The Rongorongo script from Rapa Nui is an undeciphered written language whose origins are unknown. It's found on 27 wooden plaques and consists of glyphs depicting humans, animals, plants, tools and heavenly bodies. Since the glyphs are written in long sequences and show signs of corrections, it's thought that they represent a proper writing system. Up until recently, researchers weren't sure if the Rongorongo script developed as a result of European contact or was much earlier than that. If it had developed earlier, then it's another example of the independent invention of writing, just as happened in China, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Mesoamerica. Only two wooden tablets have been radiocarbon dated before. These are Tablet Q, which is housed in the Museum of Anthropology and Ethnology in St. Petersburg, and Tablet O, which is housed in the Ethnological Museum Dahlem in Berlin. Tablet Q was dated to between 1812 and 1836, and Tablet O was dated to between 1811 and 1838. Since these dates are post-European contact, they are not evidence for an original invention. A new paper published in the journal Scientific Reports outlines the investigation of further wooden tablets housed in Rome. Tablet A, also referred to as Tahua, measures 91.2 by 11.5 centimeters and is made of the wood Fraxinus excelsior, which never grew on the island but is native to Europe. Tablet B, also referred to as Aruku Karenga, measures 41.5 by 15.2 centimeters and is made of Pacific rosewood, which used to grow on Rapa Nui. Tablet C, also referred to as Mamari, measures 29 by 19.4 centimeters and is made of Pacific rosewood as well. Tablet D, also referred to as Echancre, measures 23.9 by 12.3 centimeters and is made of Podocarpus latifolia, a wood native to southeastern Africa, which has never grown on Rapa Nui. The research team estimated the felling year of the tree from which each tablet was made and calibrated the samples using the South Hemisphere calibration curve. Tablet A was dated to between 1862 and 1977. However, the later dates were discarded since the tablet was collected earlier than this and the script was not used after the Peruvian slave raids in the late 19th century. A narrower date range was determined of between 1862 and 1887. Tablet B ranged between 1732 and 1947. For the same reasons as Tablet A, the later dates were discarded with a narrower range of between 1832 and 1857 being calculated. Tablet C was dated to between 1694 and 1840. Tablet D was dated to between 1493 and 1509, so significantly earlier than the others. To further constrain the date ranges, Bayesian modelling was carried out, but this didn't yield any significant changes. So only one tablet predated the arrival of Europeans, but was on non-native wood. This may have arrived as driftwood. The problem is wood can be preserved well in a tropical climate such as that on Rapa Nui. And since the island was largely deforested by the 19th century, it's likely that wood was often reused. Therefore, the script may have been written at a much later date than the tree the wooden tablet came from was felled. Personally, I think that it's quite obvious the script is unique and was independently invented prior to European arrival. However, perhaps the only examples to survive are the more recent ones. The outlier tablet D is an interesting piece of evidence, but this whole idea of driftwood seems a bit of a stretch. I think it's more likely that the examples that have been analysed are pretty late in date, but that the language was written down in different ways a lot earlier, as is evidenced by the rock art all over the island. This is an example of petroglyphs found carved into the rock. Let me know what you think in the comments. Research shows Scandinavia's Neolithic farmers wiped out the hunter-gatherer population. Four papers in the journal Nature outline comprehensive DNA research that has been carried out on skeletal remains in Denmark.
The study analyzed how ancient migration affected populations. Firstly, they found that around 5,900 years ago, Neolithic farmers completely wiped out hunter-gatherers in just a few generations. Violence was a part of this transition along with pathogens from livestock. Almost 1,000 years later, another population change occurred due to herders from Yamnaya in southern Russia moving to Scandinavia. This second transition probably also included violence and the introduction of pathogens carried by domesticated animals. The Amnaya people were semi-nomadic, domesticated cattle and traveled large distances using horses and carts. Previously, experts thought that these waves of migration had been peaceful occurrences, but this new information overturns this idea. So far, the little amount of DNA material from these time periods in Sweden has produced similar results to those from Denmark. It's hoped that such studies will help in the understanding of how certain diseases develop and could be useful for medical research in future. That's it. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. Thank you to my patrons and channel members, and I'll see you next time.